Cool, so thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, this session is a, a session to share how food enterprises are working towards food equality. Um, we've got uh, four guests today. And we've got Joe Macron from the Open Food Network admin team, who's a researcher on the topic. We're also joined by Kate from Kent Food Hubs Folkestone, uh, Dan from Peninsula Producers, and also Farms for City Children. And we're also joined by Ruth Redgate from Mercia Food Hub. Um, so thanks so much to our speakers for coming today. And I'm just gonna get straight into it. And we're gonna start the session with an introduction from Joe. Um, so Joe, if you'd like to unmute yourself Amy, and, and share, that would be amazing. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here today to introduce uh, this webinar on the topic of food equality and how enterprises and individuals involved in the Open Food Network can deal with the impacts of um, food poverty in their local communities. I'll start first by introducing myself. I'm uh, Joe McLaren. I have experience uh, as a food poverty uh, researcher. I was involved in Good Food Oxford as the End Hunger Campaign uh, intern, and I've presented at academic conferences on the topic of alleviating food poverty through urban agriculture. I have a master's in agroecology and food security from Coventry University. I also volunteer for Oxford Mutual Aid, which is one of the many mutual aid groups set up to deal with the economic impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The other people we'll be hearing today are from a variety of places. We'll be hearing from Kate Clements with uh, Kemp Food Hubs, Dan Lloyd-Jones, who runs uh, Peninsula Producers in West Wales and works with Farms for City Children, and Ruth from Mercia Food Hub, which is based in Lichfield. Uh, there may not initially seem to be a connection between these organisations, however they're all trying to create a deeper connection with the land and the more resilient, nourishing and equitable food system. Generally people in um, food poverty are forced by circumstance to eat um, nutritionally um, poor uh, food, also described as food from nowhere. Um, the opposite of food from nowhere is, of course, food from somewhere in which you are um, aware of the origins of your food. However, if people are able to enjoy food from somewhere, simply not good enough to simply make good quality um, food easier to access. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the disparities in access to knowledge of food, including with many people, including myself, either baking their bread for the first time or having time to produce and prepare um, good quality food. However, for many, this is not the case as the economic and psych psychological impacts of the pandemic have caused a decline in dietary quality for some. Whilst access to um, good quality food is important, so is time and knowledge and knowledge of how to prepare uh, the foodstuff term I particularly like has um, been uh, is the hourglass effect which has been used to describe the flow of knowledge about food from uh, farmer to consumer mediated by various middlemen along the way. If the general public is to move towards a high quality diet then education and knowledge sharing is important is necessary. One example of this is Farm for City Children, which aims to ensure children have access to and can gain knowledge about the countryside and understand where their food, food comes from. Another is the work of, that Kent Food Hubs are doing to empower people in, in Kent in the face of everything the world is currently throwing at people. Mercy of Food Hub is also present who are donating the, to their local food banks and to build a stronger food system in the West Midlands. We live in a very individualised society and many of the discussions relating to the consumption of uh, good quality food tend to be at an individual or household level. However, part of ensuring good quality food is also creating strong communities where there is common understanding of what is good quality food and it should be for everyone. One example of this is Kent Food Hubs, which aims 
fear in spite of the extreme uncertainty that is present in, uh, due to world events, ensure a degree of certainty by empowering people to uh, have a degree of control over their local food systems. Part of what they do is to ensure people can learn as much as possible about their local food systems and bring people uh, together. If we're to ensure everyone has can access food from somewhere, then it's necessary to not only increase the vis visibility of good quality food, but also a paradigm shift in both knowledge about food and move away from the individualized idea of food consumption. Speakers today will now describe how they and the organizations that they're involved in are aiming to move towards a, a different model that ensures everyone can have access to good quality food. Great, thanks so much, Joe. And um, so we're gonna get started with Kate from Kent Food Hubs Folkestone, if that's all right, Kate. Hi, um, we're, we're quite new to this. We've been running for um, just over a year now. So that's Folkestone and then Ashford, our sister hub, um, are having their first birthday this week. Um, we have lots and lots of producers on board. They're all lovely local producers. Um, but we initially realised that we've got our, our main customers are middle class, quite affluent, well educated, um, people who aren't living hand to mouth week to week. Um, so we initially started looking at, well, you know, what, what can we do? So, for example, we've got lovely sourdough on, but it's sort of four pound a loaf. Um, so we, we were trying to source like a, a two tier system. So those people that want the organic vegetables and the sourdough and, and everything to be literally ticking every single box and can afford to, that's fantastic. But to also make it affordable um, for your, your ordinary shopper to, to buy the same thing. We still find that our typical customer is that that middle ground. We're not really hitting um, maybe like people on the lower incomes, the people that, that um, Joe was talking about, those those people who are shopping, you know, in, in the supermarkets, lots of plastic, lots of processed foods. Um, we've also had since the pandemic started, the number of our homeless in, in the local area has, has just skyrocketed. It's crazy. So we talked a lot to our customers about, you know, what we could do and, and how we could help. And we've had um, a donation scheme running for the last couple of months, which is brilliant. However, again, we hit a bit of a stumbling block there because the local um, organisations, even the food banks, people are asking for, um, you know, tinned goods and things that they can eat quickly. They, they may, you know, if you're homeless, you don't have access to cooking facilities. So donating fresh food is, is, is pointless. You know, I mean, you can eat a few things raw, but that's that's it. So we do donate food to um, an organisation called Action on Homelessness, like directly. Um, but generally speaking, they, they would prefer to have money. So we are doing that. And, it, and it's, it's opened up this kind of like this realisation of this two tier system um, where we are benefiting the local community. But we have the benefit, the people who are donating, the people who are donating the food, the people who are donating the money and then the recipients. And although the recipients of it are you know, I mean, they're, they're receiving food, that's great. It, it's still it's still an unequal system that the people aren't being, they're not having the same experience um, from it. So we recently set up a traders panel um, so that we have, because I'm one of the directors of the Food Hub and, and we were kind of, we needed something in the middle, something where the traders have a, have a voice and they can help shape everything that we do. And on the back of that, we're, we're currently setting up an education panel and again, we didn't want to have something where we are educating people and, and they are, you know, like, oh, oh, we are here, we can do this for you. We want something that people can contribute as well. So it kind of came at the same time that we were looking to extend the offer that we have for like donations of food. Um, we were looking at one of the, the local organisations, which is called CRAN, which is the Kent Refugee Act. Um, action network we have quite a high level of, of um, refugees arriving here and they did a wonderful program last year where they um, did internet recipes so you could cook along um, from their from, you know their, their country's origin um, some really really great things so we, we've been exploring that and how actually 
okay, yes, we will be donating to people, we will be donating food, but how can we actually alter that and make it more equal so those people that are receiving it are actually um, able to participate in that process rather than just receive it. So it, it's, it's, um, it's an equal process because obviously with the food inequality that very often starts with, with people as well. Um, so we're, we're exploring that at the moment and, and it's looking quite hopeful that we may be able to come up with something that's, that's reciprocated because that's what was missing, that, that reciprocal kind of action um, that you have with a, with a donation. Um, we've also linked in with um, several local um, initiatives. So we've got the Incredible Ed Edible, which is a food corridor running. Um, we've got a, a place called Cheriton, which is up on a, on a hill coming down all the way into um, the Sandgate Community Garden. And they are planting. Um, so on the high street in Cheriton, for example, there's planters with fruit bushes in and herbs in that people can actually, you know, see food growing. You, you can walk all the way up and down and right down to the vegetable gardens in the bottom there, there's something there um there's another local project in one of the schools called the locavore garden um they are a community garden where they're growing food they're giving away grow kits anybody can go and help out they're giving away seeds so for example if you have somewhere and you, you cannot grow your own food if you live in a flat and you, you've got limited space you can actually go and plant it in the grounds of the locavore garden so We've been exploring with them rather than although we are looking at an education program rather than reinventing the wheel and diluting what they're doing we're looking at how we can link in and how we can link our traders in and most importantly how we can actually use our combined experiences of all the communities that we do work with um, to actually bring them in and, and connect connect them with like where their food's coming connect them with um how it grows, when it grows, because you know if you are one of these people that are living week to week, um, and you you know you you get your money and you know that you, you're kind of you've got to budget, you've got to fill up your freezer. It, it's kind of you are generally buying the same generic four vegetables, you know, like frozen sweet corn, carrots, broccoli. You, we've chatted quite a lot to, to local people about how we can change this and how we can challenge it. And I think with food inequality. I think a lot of it is, is the not realising that actually it can be really cheap to, to know how to cook pulses, how to prepare things, how to freeze them, how to batch cook, how to, how to actually manage that. And, and there's, there's a, a kind of a missing, I think, I, th I think some of it comes from how people are treated. So for example, if not that I do, but if I was to go shopping when I used to work full time and I had the, all four children at home before my adult children left, um, you know, I, I'd grab fish fingers and people would say, oh, I don't blame you. Yeah, if you are on a very low income and you're buying fish fingers, it's almost like, oh, poor kids. It's that kind of like, we're not, we're not treating people in the same way. So we're looking at how we're connecting with people, how we're connecting with community projects and how we can actually then connect our traders with those people to work on not necessarily an education program because I think people do know what to do but actually how it will all link in together and how it will all reciprocate so that everybody is contributing something and everybody is gaining something and that is kind of where we are where we are at at the moment um, because although we have some fantastic people I mean just I think the nature of our customers because of what we do and the kind of produce that we have on board. They're already socially conscious, um, environmentally aware people who are empathetic, who are kind, but it's making sure that it's not a, um, a faceless connection. We are going to donate some food. It's like, okay, well, why don't we find a way where people can actually mesh together and, and see what's happening there and make those connections in, in real time with real people. And now we're starting to come out and restrictions are being lifted and, and all of the um, community projects are opening up again. We're, we're getting quite excited about, um, you know, how, how, this is, how this is going to go really. So that's how we are approaching the food inequality issue um, by just getting out there and, and connecting people. And then we're gonna support what we can support. Um, obviously being a CIC, we, we do have like, you know, some surplus funds. Um, as our primary aim and then actually you know start setting up some of our own projects too we've got a community garden starting just up the road where we're going to be 
growing things and people can come and work on the garden and then we're going to cook a meal afterwards and just show how that seasonal produce can be used because it doesn't need to be expensive but it's it's that connection has been lost and even when people are helping and they are contributing there's still that disconnect um and that I just find really sad. So we're, we're doing what we can to, to combat that, which is not anywhere near, you know, there's some amazing, amazing initiatives out there, but that's that's where we are at the moment, very much in the planning stages, but that's that's how we're hoping to connect, connect people together with, you know, with us, with our producers, with what's happening. And um, and also with, with other initiatives, we're not keeping it to the to the food hubs. We're, we're hoping to actually be able to donate freezers, donate, things to help you know help help people that are um, already out there on the ground and making sure that people have food and, and and can eat but just we're hoping to offer opportunity I think it's probably the best way to sum it up. Brilliant thank you so much Kate it sounds like there's just so many awesome things going going on around you and just that yeah. Yeah. to kind of like connect and collaborate with with what's already going on and and also the imagination of what what you can do and offer it's really really Awesome to hear. So thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. And um, cool. So I'm gonna, uh, next, I'm gonna we're, we're gonna move over to Dan, if that's all right with you, Dan. And yeah, I think Dan's got some slides as well. So yeah, um, that's okay. I, I can share that myself. Um, it's all ready to go. I've enabled okay. screen sharing. So okay, cool. Is that all? Is that all on your screens? Yeah, that looks great. Fab. Okay, so okay, I've uh, sort of written stuff down because I'm not very good at talking um, on the hoof sort of thing, so I hope that's okay. Um, but um, first of all, thank you for asking me to speak this afternoon. Um, the Peninsula uh, Producers Food Hub is located in St. David's Peninsula in Pembrokeshire uh, since August 2020 we started. And looking back at the creation of the hub in many ways is very much linked to food equality and in particular addressing the problem of uh, food waste for the farm uh, that I manage. Uh, so I manage uh, Lower Triginus Farm, which is one of the three farms run by the charity Farms for City Children. Um, we host up to 39 primary age children um, at a time for a seven-day uh, seven residential. Uh, the majority of our schools are from deprived areas of the country, uh, with 85% of the schools groups coming from London. Um, but more of what we do here later. Um, then pretty much a year ago, I suppose March 20th, I think it was, we waved goodbye to a school from, from Cardiff uh, prematurely and lockdown one commenced. Um, we were pretty optimistic that the schools would be coming back in September 2020. So uh, we literally plowed on uh, with sowing the most veg that Trigonus has ever sown in 30 years. Um, and as the fruits of our labour appeared, we then realised that there would actually be no children to eat it. Um, so my head gardener, Alan, who's on the call in a minute, uh, had mentioned the Open Food Network previously. Um, and uh, to cut a long story short, we set up a profile and started to sell our produce through the Open, uh, open Food Network. Other producers locally then asked to join it. So we then set up a hub and it's still growing week by week. Uh, I think a lot of what I will talk about here today is sort of uh, ideas and dreams for how we're hoping to, to push the hub forward. And I think there's a lot of people on this call who are probably um, a lot further ahead on their journey than, than we are, but I hope that some of what I say is useful and, uh, and relevant. Um, so I'd like to talk first maybe about my experience as a producer on the hub, uh, and not as a hub manager, and how the OFM platform has really revolutionised our growing operation and has addressed many issues related to uh, food inequality and food justice. Um, so my job is to ensure that over a thousand children every year have a meaningful and purposeful experience on our farm, uh, the up and out at 7.30 a.m., milk the goats, let out the chickens, check the sheep, they chop their own firewood, muck out the donkeys, walk along the coast, and they do everything that's required uh, to keep the farm running. And in the last few years, we have ramped up our growing operation and are now pretty much a market garden. Um, Pre-using the Open Food Network software, uh, harvesting and selling veg outside of what the children used in the kitchen was a really clunky process. Um, orders were coming in by text, email, messenger, different drop-off days having to collect cash, produce invoices, and all of this was, was not really our remit. And it was, uh, uh, I was sort of spent diverted from our main uh, job, the most important thing, which was the children. Um, but by obviously, as you know, simply uploading our produce and having a pick sheet generated on a Thursday, we were building, uh, we are now building our new timetable to fit in with this um, and sort of teach the children who come here far, uh, give them a far better education about food uh, because of that. Um, we now sort of allocate um, 
different children to different crops and we can harvest exactly what we need. So there's zero food waste, which is just amazing for us. We've never been able to do that really before. And even the dodgy veg, you know, goes to the pigs and chickens. Uh, we then sort of weigh out all our uh, food um, and um, get it all bagged up. We sort of display it in our, in our farm shop and then we build the customer orders from there uh, with these children. So these children are fully engaged in the, um, in the picking, the harvest, they're handling all this food and it's amazing. Uh, and we're really excited to do this with the children who will visit in September. And they ha the harvest and handle all this variety of veg will most definitely be a new experience for most of these children, if not all of them. Um, our gardener will be imparting all his wisdom and passion for them to which they will take back to their communities and with luck, uh, a fire will be ignited within them. Um, and of course, they eat all the veg that they have seen and they'll therefore be fully connected to it. So it's a really fantastic all around experience when it comes to educating children about food. Um, and when it comes, yeah, like I said, when it comes to educating the next generation about fresh, healthy food that is grown seasonally and with care for the land, we feel we can do this um, far more effectively and uh, efficiently. Thank you, thanks to the Open Food Network. It's been, it's been fantastic. Uh, I could also talk for another 10 minutes about how good this is for the children's mental health and confidence, but that's another day. Um, again, I'm very aware that my job allows this opportunity, but so sort of just thinking how could other hubs reach children and educate them in a similar way? Um, maybe have a farmer producer drop off the harvest to a school where a hub volunteer could work with the class to weigh and pack an order. I mean, they just love weighing all that and having the customer list and making Mr. Jones's box, Mrs. Evans's box. You know, it's really, really engaging for them. And I know health and safety is a nightmare on farms. Maybe visit a farm producer and help with the harvest and collation of produce. And of course, it doesn't have to be a farm. You keep thinking farm it could be anything, couldn't it? Um, so what is the future of... Um, uh, us really. Um, we are a hub addressing food equality, hoping to improve food justice in our quality, in our community. And this is such a massive issue and very daunting when you look at the big picture, uh, especially with COVID, Brexit and the climate. So sort of to keep myself sane, I'm just sort of focusing on my sort of circle of control and not my circle of concern. And the fact that we're all here now talking together, I think, um, is proof that we are being proactive and taking control of our situation. I think that's great to see. Um, but by our hub doing just this and not being too distracted and by disheartened by the, by the bigger picture, we've now attracted over sort of 20 local producers and have gone from four boxes a week to between 40 and 50 every week at the minute and still growing. And we hopefully believe we'll, we'll double in the next six months when sort of restrictions uh, uh, ease off a little bit. Um, so it, again, in regards to food security and food equality, what we sort of achieved, and we feel we've achieved more local producers again in another market to help keep their business alive. Um, new producers are emerging after being inspired by selling on such an effective, efficient platform. More locals in the community are becoming more engaged with locally produced food due to the ease and accessibility of the system. And I think as Kate was saying, we're, still, we're sort of finding that, that issue of um, the same sort of people buying from the hub. So it's very hard to, to sort of do that. And we're sort of guilty of that. We would think we're planning on getting chickens in and on the farm and they're going to be pasture rotated and free range and all this. And we're going, yeah, we can sell it for two pound a box of eggs. And they're going, oh, what are we doing? You know, like it's so tempting to sell it at that price. But um, we know the people in St. David's who could buy that. And we definitely know the people who couldn't afford that. So it's a, it's a tough one as a, as a producer to sort of get your head around as well. Um, local producers are getting more social media time, which is really good, resulting in the community being more educated about their story and about how their food is produced or reared. And What's really, really good is pointed to the food requirements in the peninsula and the need for more producers, more producers, more jobs. Um, so that's sort of quite exciting as well. Um, so what's the future of the Peninsula Producers Food Hub? Uh, just like the values that underpin the Open Food Network, we want to create a robust and secure food system on the peninsula, which we believe would hopefully close that gap between food inequality. Um, so our challenge we experience at the moment is for current producers not to fear similar producers joining the hub. And it's our vision that producers work cooperatively, not competitively, to ensure a food system that will ultimately benefit every person on uh, the peninsula, no matter what their sort of social status. Um, and at Guinness, we grow potatoes and have welcomed the arrival of another potato producer to the hub, Graham. And if Graham was told he couldn't join the hub, as there was already a producer, then if we suffered from blight, then there would be no potatoes on the hub and, and everybody would lose out. And actually, there's two small uh, growers who are starting to establish themselves now due to the success of the hub. And instead of both having the pressure to grow a huge variety of crops to satisfy a potential veg box scheme, they're sitting down, hopefully, and talking about how they can uh, grow to their strengths and what suits their land. So that, that's quite an interesting uh, discussion, I think. 
Um, so to make up peninsula as food secure as possible and generate more jobs and get more people sort of um, engaged with food production, uh, we need to encourage more producers and fill the food gaps that we have on the peninsula. So our big plan going forward, and this is just the plan and the dream in the minute, is to trade enough to employ a full-time manager and cover running costs. And at the minute, I'm doing this for free when it's not, not sustainable. I'm on furlough, so I'm lucky I can do it at the minute. Um, any income after that, we're going to be saving. And once at a certain level, we aim to offer this money as seed money to a new producer. For example, no one produces mushrooms. So if we had £2,000 to offer with help startup costs, plus a marketplace ready to trade through, then that would be a fantastic opportunity for a new startup. Uh, this way, when the community buy from our food hub, they're not only supporting local producers, but they're helping to secure the future of the peninsula's food system too. And I'm sure we could apply for grants as well, but we would like to be as self-sustaining as possible, like our food system uh, should be. Uh, at the start of COVID, a food bank was established in St. David's that currently supports about 50 families a week. So we saw that, uh, I think it's Bow House. When I was on one call, I put a donate button on their, on their hub where customers could donate towards their local food bank. Uh, we've also done the same and raised between sort of 40 to 60 pound a week. And um, the food hub are obviously told to spend this donation in the best way they, the food pod, sorry, food bank, I'll get confused, the best way they see possible. Um, but what's been great to see, especially this week, is they started to buy items off the hub that have been sold in bulk. So uh, this week they bought sort of six big nets of Swedes, um, six big bags of potatoes. So um, see these donations being spent sort of cyclically, cyclically is, is really great to see. And we'd like to work more closely with the food bank, but one step at a time at the moment. Um, so to conclude, we're sort of excited to see where our journey takes us and to see what else we can do to address other aspects of food justice and equality. So in my opinion, the most important thing we can do is, is education. And from my position as manager of Lower Guinness Farm, uh, I now feel that our great responsibility for my team and I to do all that we can to educate the 1,009 to 11 year olds that pass through our farm gates um, every year. So yeah, thank you for your time. And I look forward to learning from uh, the other hubs and everyone else on this before. So thank, thank you very much for asking. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. And thanks so much for your slides. It was just, it was awesome to have seen this um, amazing visual array of all the awesome things you've been up to. So thanks I'm waiting so again, hopefully September now. <laughs> and also like what a joy for the thousand children that, that passed through um, farms to the children, what a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's, awesome. just, that's just our farm. And there's obviously two other farms. So there's 3,000 children in you know, a year for seven days, not just a day visit or a few hours. It's a proper immersive farming experience. So it's, it's yeah, brilliant. Such an amazing thing to, to do. So yeah, yeah, thanks so much for sharing. And no worries. Cool. So now um, we're going to pass on to Ruth Redgate from Mercia Food Hubs. And so Ruth, over to you. Hi guys, um, thanks for the invite, Kaylee. Yes, it's my busy day, it's my hub night, so bear with me if I suddenly dash off to start getting stuff out of the oven and things like that. Um, I come to this from a completely different angle. I um, got involved with the food hubs, first of all, as a producer, and this was pre, this is going back to the food assemblies, and our local food assembly wasn't being set up quick enough for my liking as a producer, and I ended up running it and taking it on for my sins. The other difference I've got is it's just me. There is no committee. It's my business. So there is no CIC. There was no ethics to start off with, if that makes sense. Um, although I do in my own right contribute to charities and do with my own business and stuff like that. But I never thought about doing it through the food hub. And then COVID hit and my orders went through the roof and I had loads and loads of inquiries for not just live, delivering in Litchfield and the local towns around me, but going further and further afield. So I now start charging delivery, but half of those delivery costs go to the YMCA, which is my charity of choice. How that's dealt with is I hold that money and when they need something desperately, they ring me because they know I've got the pot of money. I go out and get them the trolley full of sugar, if that's what they need, and go and deliver it. That's worked all the way through really, really good. Um, even doing that, I'm undercutting the supermarkets with their delivery charges. The people were, were happy and they didn't mind. And again, they don't mind paying delivery if they know it's not all coming to you. They know it's going somewhere else. It makes them feel better as well. And then coming up to Christmas, working very closely with uh, Kate from Slow Food Birmingham they'd started to put a pay it forward on with a lot of their projects so I added on a pay it forward for the YMCA and that money goes directly to them 
So every month they get a chunk of money that they can do with what they want towards the food bank or their residents. They have 71 residents in their two um, complexes. So that's where we are at the moment with food and helping those less fortunate than us. We had started, we were in very, very, very early talks with the YMCA to go in and do cookery lessons, um, especially for the 16 to 18 year old residents that they've got. Going back to the basics, they could just about put a piece of bread in the toaster, but that'd be as far as their cookery skills went. My aim was and still is, if they can go and cook eggs in three different ways, poached, scrambled, boiled, They've got a variety of meals for the week, but it's different. It's high protein, it's quick, it's easy, and they are cheap. Yes, Dan, I agree, you can sell them for £2, but we know there are people out there that don't and things like that, again, because of what they believe in. We're starting to work with our local transition group in Litchfield to see how we can connect the, uh, the dots together. They come at it very much... Um, their key things to start off with over a year ago were transport and how they could get more people into Litchfield, which is my local city, forgetting that the likes of me living in a village, if I haven't got that car, I haven't got the public transport. So it's trying to educate them back, but also say things are bigger than the transport system, we need to look wider. So we're in very, very early talks with them. So we haven't gone to the lengths at the moment or the range of projects that um, Kent are doing and Dan's doing with the farm and everything like that. But we're making slow, small baby steps. But I think also the difference is it's, it's my business. So I do need to learn, earn an income from this. So there has to be a ceiling at what point, what I can give and what I can't give away. That's Mercia for you. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing, Ruth. And I think that's a really important point that you bring up around sustainability of, of, of what you're doing. So thank you so much for bringing, um, yeah, for bringing your story and your perspective. And it sounds like you're doing, you're doing a lot as well. And I think it's really great to have had so many different types of stories today. So thank you, everyone who's who shared. It's been a really fascinating and inspiring session. Um, so now we're going to go into, we've got plenty of time um, for questions and in the question session it can be questions it can be thoughts like whatever anyone wants to chat or about or on in the space so um yeah i'm gonna leave it open if anyone has any feedback for any of our speakers um as well that would be great so. um i i'm happy to um ask a couple of um questions um First to um, Kate, um, are you happy with um, how things are going so far and do you feel like you could be uh, making uh, more connections or is it simply a matter of um, time? Um, it's, it's both. I am happy with the way things are going so far, but it's where we're coming towards the end of restrictions. Um, very much actually like you Dan I I this is one of four jobs that I have I'm self-employed so it's trying to set everything up um because I'm officially out of furlough at the moment because I work on, on community projects and obviously it depends how they how many people I'm allowed to be with um in May so I need to get as much as I can networked and set up now um to be able to streamline my time in May um so although our target to set up the education panel is um, actually by the end of September, I need to have all of the foundations and everything in place long before then and a, and a really clear plan in place. So at the moment, whilst I am, I'm, I'm really happy, you know, meeting so many people and it, it feels very much like every, every like-minded person that I meet then introduces me to somebody else and to somebody else and to somebody else. And interestingly, um, lots of these people don't necessarily know about each other. So it's kind of, it's, it's ended up with us taking a couple of steps back. And that was at the point where we said, yeah, we don't need to be setting up anything at the moment. We need to be in the same way that we, we link our customers to our traders and our traders to each other. And in the same way that we've set up a trader panel now so that we've got like a, a consensus. So for example, where we've just recently written a new traders agreement. Um, 
So we want to run that past the traders first so that there is input from everybody. So we're running a real cooperative. Um, but in the same way, we need to kind of pull people together from the community because there's this same kind of, there's lots of pockets of people doing things, but a lot of it sprung up during COVID. So lots of people aren't aware of what other people are doing. And actually, if everybody was networking together, it would really reduce a lot of our workloads and um, increase our knowledge and actually be a really cohesive um, system. But it's, whilst I am happy the way things are going, it's, it's, it's expanding at quite a rate. And I kind of sat down the other day and it was quite overwhelming actually seeing, seeing what was there and just thinking, wow, how do we, how does this all come together? How do we, do we form this? But our local council are just in the process of setting up um, I'm on the steering group with some of the local councillors, the Plastic Free Folkestone. And at the moment, I'm the only non-council uh, person on there. But the council is setting up a, an environmental group, which they are hoping to pull some of these things together. Um, and so they're looking at like popping some funding in for this and for that and for the other. So I've spoken to a couple of them already, like they can all maybe contribute, say like 100 to 200 pounds each. If, if five or six of them do that, then that's a good platform to get together um, something quite formal um, where we, we've got like groups where, where people can come together. You know, we can actually have something established and actually afford to pop somebody in charge of it and actually actually do that, because it's I think that's going to be something that happens everywhere. We've got all. I found, sorry, I'm stuttering a bit here, but I found that a lot of these um, initiatives are people who really care about their community, particularly in, in pockets, you know, people who've lived there for ages. So you've got lots of these amazing community minded people actually already running things, but they're doing it in a reactionary way, in a reaction to COVID and in a re reaction to, to, you know, food poverty as people are hitting crisis point. Um, and I think now's the time to be proactive and pull things together and really, really learn from each other. Um, but that's certainly not as easy as it as it sounds. Thanks, Kate. We've, we've actually got another question um, for you from from Jade. So, Jade, I, I don't know if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and ask the question or if you want me to read it from the chat. So. You go ahead, Kate. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, so. Um, the question is, um, I'm interested to hear more about work with refugees. Who's involving refugees in hubs and how's it going? Um, what about people with no recourse to public funds? Um, at the moment, we've just been we've just been talking several of our customers. Um, we've got customers who are mentors to the young people. So we've got lots of young men um, aged between sort of like 16 or so and, and, and 25. Um, I'm ashamed to say they've not been treated very well locally so they have got a lot of advocates and a lot of our customers are very involved in the anti-racism groups and um, in mentorship programs and involved in actually making sure that they have supplies and things so we were actually approached by um, people who who already we, we engage with because they buy through us um, so we've linked in with one of the local coordinators and at the moment it's really really early stages talking to them there's been um well long story short but basically a lot of people were herded together into a um into a, a former army barracks and it, it caused a huge covid outbreak and instead of actually they've got two bathrooms between about anywhere between two and four hundred people it's an absolute disgrace so um it's a very contentious issue at the moment and um, where we are and lots lots of the um, the residents there are being moved out and moved around so at the moment we've kind of ground to a slight halt with that um, because a lot of the, the population there are, are, are transient and a lot of people there are um, receiving some not very good treatment from some of the local people so it's something that we're really determined to do and as the weather warms up it's very, very likely that the numbers, I mean, they're regularly coming in like well, on a daily basis at the moment. The numbers are going to go up the warmer it gets. Um, it's so it's so risky. And, you know, so many of them are so traumatised. So we're working with people very gently um, there. And they were hoping to do this um, this scheme again where they, they did cookery lessons on course or, uh, on, online. They were hoping to do that again this summer. 
So we're going to support that in every way that we can, hopefully with um, produce to start with. So we'll provide everything that they need. And then also with the donation system. But because, you know, so many people are coming here that would love to work, that would love to contribute and, and can't, you know, they're legally not allowed to. We want to find a way to keep them empowered and to actually, rather than just say, you know, here's a donation. I mean, they're incredibly grateful, which is wonderful, but these are people that want to give something back. These are uh, people just like us who have, have fallen on the most horrendous times and have found themselves here. So we're treading very carefully in, in, in the way that we are, are moving forward, keeping them empowered, keeping them involved and sort of seeing, seeing what they want to do as well. Um, you know, so it's a, a really reciprocal um, system fairly much does that answer your question so it felt a bit rambly <laughs> yeah thank you Joe. um yeah um i've spotted a question here from someone called um julie gray um was it to anyone in particular um i i was just um going to ask about um, if you're teaching classes to people sort of digitally or on Zoom or whatever, how do you deal with data poverty or no access to internet? Obviously, obviously people need access to the facility to do classes and so on. So how, how do you tackle that with refugees? That's a big question. I know. Is, is there support? Is there funding for that? Um, CRAN actually currently deal with that. So they, they have a centre that they use where they have English lessons. Um, and I, I'm hoping to get in there with some other projects that I'm doing as well. But yeah, they've, they've provided all the support with that through their own funding. So um, we've just kind of, we're hoping to just kind of piggyback along alongside that. But as I say, we're, we're still in, it's very hard not being able to physically meet people at the moment. So it's all been via email so far. Um, but yeah, they last year they they actually have um, classrooms, so they have and that their, their mentors provide them lots of um, lots of resources and help as much as they can. So quite a lot of it's in the form of donations, but they do have access to funding as well. Um, and they're they're amazing. What they what they do is amazing. The opportunities that they're they're affording these young people is is yeah really inspiring. It's great. Thank you. I've got a question if that's if that's okay um it's more sort of um we've had a, we did a survey the other day and it was um uh how can you connect with the sort of the the older generation in in St David's who possibly haven't got access to the internet or um and can't access the platform it's just I've got a few ideas but I was just wondering if anyone's had that problem and, and has addressed it in any way um if no one else can answer I know that um, from Lurpen's point of view of support team, um, this was very prevalent at the beginning of lockdown this time last year. And a number of hubs, um, Stralco and Tamar in particular, they pioneered a scheme where they did what's called phone buddies. And so um, if someone who was didn't want to order online or didn't have internet access, they'd have their phone number and they'd be able to take an order from them and put it through the back end of the system. Um, by back end, I mean back office order, which you probably already know about. So um, if I can drop a, a link in the in the Slack. Uh, in, not in, the, in the chat ch channel, um, Dan, for you to yeah, just explain how to do this. Yeah, that'd be fab. Thank you. Actually, um, Ruth, um, I think you might have experience of doing that, or at one point you were talking about um, doing that for some of your customers. Are you able to give any feedback to Dan about it? Or Yeah, we were looking at it. Um, it was more to do with another hub that I'm involved with, with the country market. So we've got a lot of that demographic don't have uh, the computer or anything. Um, unfortunately, with the previous committee, they hadn't quite gone online quick enough before COVID hit, so we were always playing catch up and everything, but we do regularly have one customer who phones me up and goes, right, can you read me out the list of jams? 
and I read out a list of jams and she then orders. It's not the ideal situation. And thankfully, with the country market, we don't have that many products on compared to the, the Mercy of Food Hub. So it's very easy to do. Um, but if we'd have had more time, hindsight's a wonderful thing. It is something we would have set up. We would have got um, not necessarily order forms, but we would have had um, lists printed of everything that we stock or everything that we can manufacture that they could take away with them. And then if something like this happened, they could phone up and go, have, have you got any strawberry jam? Have you got any bake oil tarts and do it that way? But yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, sorry, my internet cut out, so I've been kind of ducking in and out and just caught the tail end of that conversation. Wondering if there are any, any more questions or if there are any other topics that people would like to talk about in this. Yeah, I've got a a question. I've got two questions. The first one um, from Kate. Could, Kate, could you talk a little bit more about your traders panel a bit more in depth? That, is, that sounded really, really interesting. And uh, another thing that Dan and I often talk about is, you know, if we're going to employ someone full time, what percentage do you charge on the, the food or on the on the as a percentage to, to help employ someone? Um, there is a local food hub which which charges quite a lot, um, and it would be really interesting to have an idea of how do you how do you do that? How do you um, pitch that? That would be probably from from, from Ruth and Kate really. Um, the okay. trader panel, first of all, um, was there's there's three, well, there's three of us. There's three directors, and um, I came on board as a director in. July and the food hubs in Kent were actually established um, and started so Ashford was set up a week, a week yeah this week last year and we've been going for about sort of seven or eight weeks so as they were putting everything in place Covid hit and the pandemic hit and our orders went through the roof I'm sure many of you experienced that it was just crazy um, so people were onboarded lots of people turned to us very much like all of you you know it was kind of yeah, what can we do to support you bringing people on? And a lot of the processes got lost. So when I came on board in um, July after Philip and the original director left, um, it was a case of kind of like working retrospectively and, and setting up all of these things and unpicking some of the issues. I mean, we were still running fine, but, but just to my mind, there wasn't enough um, structure and recourse and you know things that had been done in quite a rushed way. So it seemed the easiest thing to do was to do it with our traders. So it was a way of um, evaluating their experiences simultaneously and sort of saying, you know, is there something that you would change? Is there something that you would like to do? And the way that they were onboarded seemed to be um, an issue. They, they, they felt that it was very formal, slightly unfriendly. So, um, the, yeah, the idea of the, the trader panel was kind of born. So although I'm pretty much running it at the moment that's just because there are certain things like the um like the new trader agreement we've nearly finished it now and some of the policies and things like that which as directors um we needed to to have that direct line to um while, while we're implementing it but we really really didn't want it to be um like a hierarchical system so the way i see it as, as directors we um we audit and we do need somebody, if, if people, somebody say started, I don't know, not picking on Dover because there's anything wrong with Dover, but if somebody decided to set up a Dover food hub and just literally onboard anybody, you know, um, replace packaging, you know, we're being dishonest. We, we do need something there to say, well, you can't operate as a food hub, that's not ethical. So we do need that. But in terms of actually running it, the whole point of us being a food hub is to provide support and a platform to our traders and a connection to their community and their customers. And what we do, I'm also one of the hub coordinators in um, folks, and what we do is facilitate that. So there was this slight disconnect between the directors and, and policy and the things like the traders agreement and then the traders, which kept coming to us as coordinators and trying to run 
a hub and implement these things um, at the same time was proving quite difficult. So the trader panel, we just literally just put a shout out on the WhatsApp group and said, hi, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be revamping. We know lots of you aren't very happy with the trader agreement. Would you like to be involved in um, rewriting it? And what do you think would, would be in it? And it's been incredible. As a result, um, up until now, the which I, I never felt right. Um, it felt a bit like the... Um, you know how like you know coca-cola can make all of their products and then it's up to the end user to recycle it the responsibility so all that plastic comes from the end user and actually it should be from the producer so we have our 12 percent that we add on for admin and whatnot um so the customer are actually paying um for the, the platform to run for for wages it, it, you know it's paying for everything and our traders really felt that actually they should be paying, you know, I mean, they get to sell to us every week. And so they came up with the idea of actually paying a weekly or a monthly contribution to the hub to keep everything going and to keep everybody invested and accountable. Um, and they've been a real driving force. We've only had three meetings so far, but it's meant we've almost got the trader agreement done. And it also means it, it's fluid. So we've got, um, at the moment, I, I did not want to share it because it's not right. I'm not a trader. So I'm the secretary and then one of our traders is a, a chairperson, but she's about to have a baby. So we're looking for, for maternity cover at the moment. Um, but it's running really well and it, and it means people can be invested as much as they like or as little. So if, for example, um, we're looking at things like, like buying power. Um, when you're starting up as a hub, it, it's really hard to find sustainable packaging. If you're a brand new producer and you've got a very small market, you don't want to spend lots of money on you know sustainable packing. However, on the trader panel, you know, if, if we can actually get a group of people together to share those costs in bulk buy, yeah. that brings their prices down and it, and it increases their, their buying power. So it's, it's got lots of benefits. And it also means if there is anybody who's not happy, for example, with something that we're doing, they've got the opportunity to, to come and discuss it with their peers and um and come to a resolution a consensus so it's it's working it's working well so far uh, it's early days again um but it's yeah it's it is it is going well does that, that is there anything else that you wanted to ask i mean we're we're, we're still a baby a baby trader panel at the moment but it's, it's getting we're pre-baby <laughs> <laughs> Alan, with regard to your other question about commission, I know Louise has popped um, an answer in the chat and so is Rachel. Um, I charge 20%, that was a hangover from the food assembly. But 20%, one of the main reasons that seems to be pretty standard is most traders will give a trade discount of 20%. So you then add your 20% back up, you're up to recommending retail price. Um, the flexibility you have with, especially with OFN, is if you have a new producer who just wants to try it out, you can drop their commission to 5%. That gives them a chance to have a, a chance to get their uh, footing, get a customer base going, and then you can slowly start to increase it. So it's not noticeable so much for the customer, but it then brings them back in line with what you're charging everybody else. That's good, thank you. That's thank really you. interesting, thank you both. Yeah. There's also a couple of um, comments in the chat for you, Alan, as well, from uh, Rachel Tamar and Louise's comment as well. Um, just because we've only got five minutes left and I see that, Jade, you've got your hand up. And did Dan, did I see you with your hand up too? But I was wondering, Jade, if you'd like to ask a question. Dan, do you want to go first? I've already had a question. Jules pressing. Go no, on. go for it. I think my hand wasn't up. All right, okay. Uh, I want to know about uh, Addressing food poverty in rural areas, that most of the really interesting things going on seem to be happening in cities. Um, so if anyone's doing anything in very rural areas, not even towns, but really rural areas, I'd like to hear. I suppose that where we are is, is pretty rural, um, but I haven't got a really good answer, I don't think, yet. I think we're still, still at the early stages, but um, I, I think hopefully just our overarching aim of, of, of plugging all these food gaps um, will maybe generate uh, better food and maybe better opportunities for people to to farm or to grow or, or to produce and if we can sort of help with that that, that would be fantastic but um, I haven't got a fantastic answer I'm sorry that's, that's the best that we're doing at the minute.
Does anyone else um, have any knowledge or experience around this or anything they'd like to share? Or Jade as well, do you have any uh, thoughts on this from, from what you know and your experience too? I think it's really tricky. I think it's overlooked. No one's talking about it. There's, there's lots of talk about urban food poverty um, and it doesn't come up all food poverty and it's really difficult people can't even reach the food bank they're not even on the radar i think it's really tricky i think he's thinking about and maybe it's then maybe it's a good place to think about it because a lot of the food hubs are in rural areas whereas the food poverty projects are more often in urban areas that's for the agenda i think it's an interesting question and um yeah can I, so, can I say something? So I'm, so I'm in a, a, a town just south of Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. So I've met Jade before. Um, we operate a community larder in this town, but we've got lots of rural communities round about us. So some of them have got actually food sheds or they've been utilising um, unused phone boxes. So they've built up little community pantries and a lot of farms have got spud sheds where people actually go along and, and contribute something to get some potatoes or some vegetables. Um, we're not quite as far on where we have many food hubs or, or um, networks where people are working with farms, but I think that's something we definitely need to look at going forward. We use a lot of food waste within our community larder and we're part of the Fair Share programme. Um, so I would say for the last sort of four months, We've had a lot of excess from supermarkets and the impact that it's had on, sorry, the dog's going daft, the impact it's had on those that need to access the community larder has been absolutely amazing. It's been really immense. Um, and I think overall, the general health of the people accessing the fresh fruit and vegetable has, has really improved. So it is doable, but it's really hard to reach people, especially when they don't have transport. Thanks so much for that, GB. Um, really interesting to hear about the community um, pantries. It's a really, really cool thing to do. So thanks for sharing. And um, I noticed a couple of notes from Rachel in the chat. Um, wondering, Rachel, if you feel like unmuting yourself and sharing those, or I don't mind reading them out too. So. My internet's just so it's Rachel people. from Tamar. Oh. Okay, cool. No worries. So I might cut, but um, next week we're um, looking at top up star matches. Um, okay, actually, Rachel, I think your internet um, is pretty bad. Maybe worse than mine. Sorry. So I think you're cutting out quite a bit. So. Um, I'm going to I'm going to read your comment if that's okay. Mine's not great either, but hopefully I'll. I'll um, so Rachel from Tamar sharing that we're just starting to use our customer giving through the hub to top up the value of healthy start vouchers to six twenty, which we're looking to promote through local town council, baby groups, children's centres, etc. Locally, and the food bank in the hope to reach more local families who may not know about us already. And. Um, Ruth has a comment for you as well. I don't know if Ruth, if you want to unmute and say that because your internet seems seems good. Yeah, um, I'll touch base with Rachel later because we've literally just been accepted to um, take Healthy Start vouchers. So that's really interesting that Rachel's looking to top those up. So I'll have a chat with Rachel separately about how that's going to work because I think that could be really, really interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, just to interrupt, but I would really love to hop onto that conversation as well, because we're looking at what else we can do here in Stroud as well, please. Yep. Thank you. Cool. I think you're all members of the Thriving Food Hubs group. If you don't already have each other's contact details, you could, um, or I'm happy to put you in touch as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Katie. Thank you. You're not already. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to read out one more comment from Jade, and then I think we're probably going to wrap up because it's coming up to six o'clock. So um, Julie mentioned waste surplus food and fair share. We've started a conversation about whether OFN members can begin to use OFN to distribute waste food to low income households. That's really interesting. So thanks for. Does anyone have anything to add on that? 
before we sign off for the evening? Okay. Awesome. So thank you everyone for, for coming and especially big thank you to, to everyone who spoke today. It's been a really fascinating and awesome session. So and really inspiring to hear about all of the amazing things that you're that you're doing and also all of the ideas for the future as well. Um, so yeah, so thanks so much for that. And next week we're doing a webinar on crowdfunding and we've got a guest from crowdfunder.co.uk who's coming to speak and um, talk a bit about what is crowdfunding and how it might be able to help you. And so that's next Tuesday. Um, so I hope to see some of you there. And yeah, so um, yeah, have a great rest of the week. And thanks, thanks so much everyone for coming. Hey. And if you want to unmute and say goodbye, that's always great. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.